with all the crazy stuff that's going on in the world right now. First we had this whole pandemic thing. Now we've got lo what looks like a, a civil war happening in all over the world. I want you to consider another thing that I think could be the black swan or the curveball that a lot of people weren't thinking about. My guest today is a man named Christian Westbrook. Some of you guys might be familiar with his work, The Ice Age Farmer. He's at iceagefarmer.com. And he's going to present a hypothesis that I think is of the utmost importance for you to consider and start preparing for. Christian has put together a lot of data and he does this almost every day on his YouTube channel. He puts together data, weather data around the world, scientific data. None of this is theory. He basically just piles up the facts that we are going into a period of low solar activity. And I'll leave it to him to, 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 to make the case because he does make it very well. But this is something that we need to consider. I saw one of Christian's videos uh, a couple weeks ago called Solar Lockdown and in that he correlated the collapse of many empires in history with these low solar activity periods and it is something else and when I saw it I was I was blown away um, he, he really presents, presents the data well and I think this is something that that you need to look at because we can we, we can have a, a significant effect on this outcome for ourselves. You know, it's one thing to, um, you know, what, what can you do about the government telling everybody to close their businesses? Uh, what can you do uh, about some kind of civil war, some, all these brown shirts going around and kicking in business doors? You can, you can do little things to prepare for this, but this is one thing when it comes to weather patterns changing that you can really do. And, and uh, this is a call to small farmers. Small farmers can go out and make significant changes to accommodate the, the, the changing weather patterns that we're going to see. And we are seeing and we have been seeing for a long time. So hold on to your, uh, your seats. This is going to be a very interesting one. I would encourage all of you to, um, after this, go and check out Christian's work. He's got some great content up there at iceagefarmer.com. You can find him on YouTube. Let's get into it. So Christian, thanks for joining me here. I'm thrilled to be here, Curtis. Thanks very much for having me. Yeah. So, you know, what I'd really like to do in this conversation is um, maybe to start perhaps introduce yourself, uh, kind of what you do and what got you into all this. But I really want to introduce my audience to some of the principal hypotheses that you present um, at the Ice Age Farmer, because I think more people need to know about this stuff. So yeah, maybe to start, just tell us a little bit about you. Sure thing. So my name is Christian Westbrook. I do have uh, a channel called the Ice Age Farmer channel, which is now on YouTube, and then more broadly, trying to get uh, spread out a bit more. And I'm thrilled to be here. You know, Curtis, I've been aware of and a fan of your work for some time, and I it, it, you are one of the top go-to names when one of the most popular questions I get, which is what do I do? How do I grow food if I'm in an urban setting? <laughs> right. Yeah. So, so a lot of people looking to make as much of a difference as they can, but where they are. And so that's, that's a fantastic resource that you've created there. And thank you for that. And I'm thrilled to be here with your audience as well, because it's an awesome group of people that, um, that already, you know, my core message is to start growing food and to, to build a community around those ideas and today everyone here is already ahead of the game so i'm i'm thrilled and honored to be here and um what got me into this was really looking deeply at our food supply and then at the history of climate cycles and solar cycles and so um what we'll what we'll see is that there are you know there's a there's a very basic 11 year sort of heartbeat to the sun but there are deeper cycles as well that have very significant effects on a lot of things that are going on on this planet, including agriculture and crop production. And when you look back at some of these cycles, um, you see that, that the effects they've had on society and even on the rise and fall of empires is significant. And so it, it seems to me that that's worth looking at, particularly when we see also from the data right now that we are exiting a period of, of heightened activity and going into yeah. a period of, of lower activity. And so that really raised the question to me of what does that mean? What, you know, how are we going to feel that? 
and how did this play out in the past? And so I'm, I think we can, uh, I'm looking forward to that conversation. Yeah. Amazing. Um, how, like, how did you, I, I know you do like a, quite a bit of indoor growing yourself and, and you know, what, what got you into, uh, go, doing that and how long have you been doing that for? Um, so I think a number of things, right. There's sort of the confluence of like, it's just healthier. And then as I became more and more aware of the threats, the imminent threats to our food supply, I think a, a sense of not just that it was the right thing and that there's something uh, primal and very intuitive and good about humans and cultivation. You know, I think we all need to be reconnected to our food in, in a sense um, at, at a very basic level, but then also just, I think a sense of urgency around, you know, there are, there are changes going on right now between uh, the consolidation of our food supply into a very few players, big agricultural corporate players um, that uh, then best be fought by taking control back, right? By us all growing food and saving seeds and making sure that we restored the genetic diversity. Um, a lot of those messages that are out there. So yeah, I started indoor because I was in San Francisco. I was in the same boat that, that we were acknowledging. Right in the a lot Bay of Area. In. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So a little, little tiny place in the Bay Area and started with indoor farming of uh, crickets as a protein source. And I grew some spirulina, uh, the algae in a tank. And so really started with like the, what, what, are, the, <laughs> what are the alternative ways we can achieve self-sufficiency in terms of food supply? And then the more and more of those experiments you know, they're, they're interesting, but, but more and more as I got my hands, literally as I got my hands dirty with growing and with, with learning how soil and the microbiome therein works, it just became clear that that's, you know, that's God's way of growing food. And so more and more I've been focused on regenerative agriculture and permaculture and taking it into the dirt. Yeah. Wow. Amazing. You're not in the Bay Area. Are you in the Bay Area still? No, no. I've moved uh, east of Sacramento right now. Okay, good thing you got out of there, man. It looks like it's turning into a hellhole in that city right now. In a lot of cities right now, yeah. It's, a, it's an interesting it is. time. Yeah. It is, it is. Okay, so let, let's jump into it. Let's, um, let's get the, uh, this, the, the Ice Age Farmer hypothesis, the sort of general download of uh, some of the things you've been putting together uh, for the last little while. Definitely. So let me just share a couple of slides because there are some things that are easier to see than to uh, vocalize. And Absolutely. So, Awesome. And so, like we said, our sun, there, you know, there's a reason that people have worshipped it since the beginning of time. It has a lot of effects on our planet and the way that it's behaving is driving a lot of things on our planet. And as I mentioned at the top, um, there is sort of a basic 11 year um, heartbeat to the sun. It's called the Schwab cycle. It's the most basic sort of the up and downs we're seeing there. And that is sort of the, the basic behavior that you expect. Um, from solar activity. There's a number of ways you can measure solar activity from the, you know, from the energy that's actually being put out, uh, the flux to just sunspots are actually a very good proxy for that. And so this is a graph of sunspot activity looking back a few hundred years, and you can very easily see that 11 year cycle up and down. But also you notice that there's sort of this like increased activity, this m uh, grand maximum, which is called the modern grand maximum, that we've been enjoying for the last hundred years. And that translates into the way we experience that on earth is nice, stable growing seasons, a strong jet stream and uh, conditions that are good that we've gotten used to. In fact, most of modern agriculture, and this is part of the problem, depends on, it's bespoke. It depends on us having this strong solar conditions and then the stable right. growing seasons that go along with it. Um, but you can also see, you know, some craziness over here. So if you look back a couple hundred years, you see this dip where although the 11 year cycle was still going on, it was muted, it was diminished. And uh, this is called the Dalton minimum. And there were some weird things that happened, including, um, you know, seismic and volcanic activity picking up and then crop losses as a result of uh, growing season instability and growing zones shifting. And then so too, again, when you look back even further, do you see where the 11 year cycle just seems to have fizzled out completely. And these are called the grand minimums of activity. So grand solar minimum. And um, when you look, you know, this is not esoteric thing. As you can pull this kind of information straight from Wikipedia, where they describe that we've been in this modern maximum, like I said, for the better part of 100 years here, but that we have now exited that maximum. And so as I was saying, this to me already indicates wow. 
that there's something we need to know about here. There's something we need to understand better. Absolutely. One real quick, how is it that um, this is all public information? This is you're not you're not just pulling out <laughs> conspiracy videos on YouTube. This is public information. It's amazing to me. How did the climate change narrative of global warming go for so long when this was all out there? Well, there's a lot of money behind that agenda. I think that there's, there's a number of questions about how climate change replaced all science and all, all reality yeah, with, with right. the propaganda. And um, I think we could talk for hours about that alone. It's, fa it's right. fascinating, genuinely. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, I think that... Um, this and there have been we'll talk about a few scientists that have been talking about this so it's not that it was ever erased or hidden it's just that the mainstream narrative drives straight over it and so people right. by and large are not aware of it yeah okay so um so right here we are coming out of the modern maximum and uh we've enjoyed coming out of the solar cycle 24 which is sort of right here this one we've just exited which you can tell was on the, it was a low one. It was coming out of the maximum, but it was even lower than, it looks a lot like the beginning of the Dalton minimum back here. And NASA's own predictions for solar cycle 25 are also pretty low here. Um, and it looks a lot like an echo of the Dalton minimum. And so when we look back at, in fact, NASA describes this now as conditions are going to be great for space travel because the sun's output will be low and so there won't be as much radiation. And so those of us who live in the ISS are, are going to benefit from that. But that's really kind of missing the, the message there. What about those of us who are still on Earth? Um, yeah, no doubt. Yeah, even NASA themselves 15 years ago was totally transparent about the fact that there are real correspondences between solar activity and the climate on this planet. So this is from NASA. In fact, it's still on NASA's site that says, hey, during the Dalton, I'm sorry, the Maunder minimum, when solar activity dropped off, temperatures also fell across the Northern Hemisphere. And here's a little graph that gives you an idea of uh, how severely they plummeted. During this period, few sunspots appeared and the brightness decreased of the sun. The impact is pretty clear that you can see the temperature differential. So again, this is from NASA and we've seen like, from Wikipedia and NASA, this is unambiguously stating that these are the, the things that are going on in the sun and the relationship they have to what's going on on Earth. So I thought that was helpful to dig a little further back to see that NASA actually used to talk about what's going on and now is sort of not, not acknowledging it quite as much. Yeah. Um, there are other people that are, that are aware, like we said, there are other people that are, that are aware of what's going on and they're also aware of the effects that it has had historically, which we'll dig into briefly. But I just wanted to acknowledge one of those people is Sean Hackett, who's an agricultural analyst and financial advisor in that space. And, uh, you know, he has been very public and made TV appearances where he says, look, this sun is dropping off right now. It's at record low levels. We're going to have to come up with entirely new ways to feed people because the way we've been doing it isn't going to continue to work. Conditions are changing. In fact, from that interview, he says, look, I don't want to, and I, and I feel the same way. I'm not about doom and gloom. I have no interest in scaring people in any way, fashion or form. Um, this is just what's going on now. But the world, quote, we are heading into is a world of scarcity and local famines. It's not going to be pleasant. It's going to be difficult. We're going to have to figure out how to feed people as modern agriculture falls over. And um, so let's talk a little bit about why that actually happens. And we won't get too far out of the science in this conversation, but I think it's important just to sort of cover our bases. When the sun drops in its, in its output, when it starts... Um, when it becomes a little muted, it provides less protection to us, to Earth, from all the other influences from space. And one of the ones that's, that's chief among those is called galactic cosmic rays. And we can see here over the last few years that those indeed, as we would expect, have been rising. It seems like they rise even more um, abruptly the further north you get in latitude. So it's kind of interesting that the equator sort of insulates you as you get closer to it. But, mm. um, but so when we look at what that means. What do galactic cosmic rays do? How does that actually inter interface with us and how do we experience them? Um, galactic cosmic rays definitely have increased, measurable increases in seismic and volcanic activity. So earthquakes and volcanoes are more likely to be happening, especially as you enter into and out of that minimum. Uh, there's generally more cloud cover 
Uh, there's huge hailstorms. We've seen some of the like the record melon-sized hail just in the last few weeks here. It's been out of control. Um, the jet stream itself weakens, and so um, that I'll show a picture of here in a second. That what that means is that there are uh, these sort of wavy meridional. It's called jet stream flows where let's just go where um, pockets of of the cold Arctic air will slip down. And vice versa, pockets of warm air from the equator will, will sort of slide up further than they're supposed to. It's kind of like a... Just kind of like where you get that, uh, we've had for the last couple of years, those polar vortexes that come into North America. And there you go. <laughs> you, you read my mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah we're feeling it. That's a, we experienced that or the media has popularized that, put it into, into colloquial language as, yeah, as the polar vortex and as, and as global warming on the flip side. So it's... Yeah, um, absolutely. So those are, those are what it looks like as the jet stream weakens and then these pockets of air that were trapped where they should have been before, giving us those stable growing seasons that we were enjoying break down. And so suddenly we get, like we just got um, over these past few weeks, really cold temperatures across China that decimated a lot of wheat in their prime Henan and their prime wheat growing area. And so they're... Um, actively going out and storming wheat supplies and hoarding it right now. People in America don't seem to be nearly as aware of what's going on there. But, um, but so that's, a, that's just a super quick look at that mechanism of action that without the sun's protection, we are subjected to more of these influences from space. And, uh, and that's what they, that's how they come in is the galactic cosmic rays. And that then the effects that that has, I think are best understood by looking to the past and seeing what happened the last few times, because it is a cycle, right? None of this is unprecedented or a freak occurrence. These are natural cycles. We've survived them before and we shall again. And that's helpful also to, to bear in mind. But when we look back at the Dalton minimum, which we said we're pretty much experiencing an echo already by NASA's own data. Um, yeah, there were massive uh, changes to climate patterns. You can see here that the river Thames actually froze over completely and they had the was called the Great Frost Fair of 1814, sort of enjoying and celebrating the weird fact that the river completely froze over and they could go out there. So this is depicted in you know, popular culture and in art as well as in history. Um, there were uh, changes to the precipitation patterns, heavy rains that, that flooded out the, the crops and uh, in some cases actually flooded out people in their lives. And uh, these then resulted in an inability to feed the, the livestock and in general people. And so that's translated always into famines and then tremendous loss of life. We're talking tens of tens of millions of people across Europe that lost their life in some of these famines. The great 15, wow. uh, yeah, the great famine of 1315 to 1317, as I just said, started off with these low temperatures, the increased cloud cover, and then these precipitative extremes, which means you can have either a drought or this deluge that just floods everything out. And uh, yeah, it was staggering. That was a quarter of the people in Europe during the wolf minimum of 1300. But was that, that wasn't th that wolf minimum and the one that you mentioned before that, were those grand solar minimums or were these part of those 11 year cycles? No, 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 these are definitely uh, grand minima because you can each, each, within the 11 year cycle, each is called a solar maximum and a solar minimum. And so okay. it really only gets, and there are, you know, during, even in that 11 year cycle, you do see to some extent, right, to a very limited extent, those fluctuations in the way we experience conditions, but it's yeah. not really until the sun dips down and then doesn't recover or just stays at those muted levels that we start to talk about these, these deep solar minimums um, being grand minimums and then having some of these effects. And so just one question too on the history here, during that say wolf minimum period, um, no doubt a very cold winter and probably, um, you know, uh, a colder shoulder season. But this doesn't necessarily mean, per se, there's no summer, correct? It doesn't mean there is no summer, although in many of the records we see, in fact, I'll, I'll, I've got a quote from Thomas Jefferson where he describes during the Dalton minimum that... Um, that uh, that there were tremendous changes to the precipitation patterns. He was talking about droughts where they were getting less than a tenth of the rain they would usually get in a year. And also that there would be frosts 
in some locations in every month of the year. So summer wow. happens, but you're still, your growing season is, can just be completely shot. Yeah. Wow. And such was certainly the case when we talk about the Maunder minimum, which is like in that period where it bottomed out completely for a bit. Yeah, so that was, yeah. a, a, you know, that was the real deal. And uh, it was described here as all things that grew above the ground died and starved. And uh, it's a well-documented period where famine ravaged much of Europe and, and indeed around the world. Do I still have you, Curtis? Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah, I'm just okay. sorry. sorry. <laughs> just letting you uh, do your thing. Perfect. So as we look back even further, um, when we look at the, the, sun, the solar activity and the rise and fall of Chinese dynasties, it turns out there's a tremendous correspondence. And this is not by accident, right? So an emperor comes in and has the divine right and the crops are doing well and uh, the, the civilization blooms. And then at some point, as the sun's activity drops off and the food production falters, then all of a sudden the emperor clearly isn't pleasing God anymore. And so the people wow. get upset and there's tremendous unrest and they depose him and then the whole cycle begins again. So it's not just, it's not fair just to call this a cycle, a natural cycle of the sun, but it's intimately a part sociologically and culturally of everything we've experienced on this planet going back. And uh, yeah, it's, it's fascinating. That, that, that right there is, is, is an absolutely incredible uh, correlation and, and when you can it, but it, yeah you, lining up those timelines it's just so interesting it's um, it really makes me you know it really puts what's happening now into perspective but um, it you could you could fill us up you could kind of philosophize about it until you're blue in the face if it is what we're experiencing now is a direct correlation of that or is this all very complicated where there's a lot of things happening at once i think certainly it's very complicated i think it's a very dynamic system and there's a ton of things interplaying you know the magnetic sphere is dropping off as well in some ways actually we're going through a perfect cosmic storm where there's not just additive effects but multiple you know exponential effects of these things we lose our magnetic sphere as we lose the protective shield from the sun and um, and there are some ways in which the, this confluence of cycles is indeed unprecedented. But I don't think it's really helpful to think of it in, in that kind of an extreme alarmist terms as much as like this is, no matter what, this is, here we are on this planet. We've been here for a long yeah. time. Yeah, we, we, we can find a way through this. And I'm confident we can. Yeah. Um, although certainly this underscores the fact that if empires have risen and fallen with these cycles before, then um, we should pay pretty close attention to what's going on we should we should heed that uh, this could be a severe occurrence or um, absolutely yeah and it is and so we're experiencing these things the same things that we see when we look back in history by the way i've got a wiki called wiki.iceagefarmer.com with an extensive history section because i really think that's there's tremendous value in seeing how this played out in the past so that we yeah. can understand what we're up against now you, know, you have to sort of transpose those uh, natural things onto the the backdrop of modern society to to, to play out the scenarios, but um, but it's still very helpful. And indeed, now we we see um, these things happening right now. So, in terms of growing zones shifting, you know, here's a quote from an article where parts of Spain and Italy that have been sort of the um, the breadbasket, but of of greens for uh, for Europe for for years for all of you know for recent history, are now all of a sudden encountering these frosts that were just not part of the story beforehand and so the weather conditions quote in the formerly safe growing areas of italy and spain are not safe anymore they're becoming increasingly extreme and i caught an article um, you know i mentioned that we just had tremendous colds affecting china and those were affecting south korea as well and in some of the admittedly google translated um, articles coming out of south korea we saw quotes like this where you know, the damage is, is growing. It's a staggering amount, 18,000 acres, I think, this year. And um, so year over year, the, the damage is, is considerable and increasing. And so, quote, there are voices of concern that this cold damage to crops is becoming, it's becoming a regular thing. It keeps happening. This is because low temperature damage keeps occurring. Each year since 2018, 
and the magnitude of the damage is considerable. In fact, the new one of the new ministers that was just put into office over there, this new official, said, as one of his campaign promises, I'm going to be focusing on recovering from these low temperature disasters. And it's not just, you know, that's not unique. There are also uh, a frost emergency that was declared in Italy, where they had late season frosts that injured a lot of their olive groves. And so for the first year, Italy is actually having to import olive oil this year. And that also, you know, that's, that's not just a crop loss that translates into, as you see here, there were um, olive farmers who donned orange vests and went out to, because they lost 57% of their harvest. And so wow. they went out to the government and said, look, you're going to have to bail out the olive farmers in this case. Um, and it's just astounding to see, yeah, how quickly these things can translate into very real social changes, cultural effects. Wow. Um, and again, so that's, that's another example of the growing zones shifting, the growing seasons changing out from underneath us. And all of this is, is, is complicated now by, you know, the, the, the pandemic that we've been experiencing, the fact that the ports have been closing, the supply chain has been drastically impacted by this. Um, the U.S. and the West in general, but especially the U.S. and Canada, are um, are really not doing a good job of managing the fact that these that this infection is going into meat plants, and now they're increasingly talking about harvest labor and social distancing on farms and even in small operations, which is insane. You know, I think it's, yeah, it's just needless to say that's that's a tremendous cost if it's even possible. I've seen articles out of, you know, Oregon and Washington where um, people who have orchards are already getting rid of parts of their orchards because they can't even get, not forget the, you know, growing food and harvesting it. They can't even get enough labor onto their operation just to keep oh, yeah. their, their stuff. Oh, we're, we're seeing it all over here in, in my area. We're in a total bread basket. The Okanagan Valley is a absolutely abundant agricultural area. And Right now, we're in, what, mid-June, and a lot of the fruit stands that are normally open are not open, and a lot of these guys aren't even, they can't even open their farms in the way that they have in the past because they don't have the labor. They can't afford to have these Mexican guys that normally come here come and sit in two weeks in quarantine and then get on the farm. So they're basically just taking these massive losses. It's crazy. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. Yeah. And, um, and so we've seen some of the, especially the blue governors are quick to side with the, um, the unions and things like that. And just, you know, Washington's governor Inslee literally just said, we're going to let the cherries rot in the fields and not insane. Gonna, yeah. Not going to harvest it. Billions of dollars left of crop in the, in the ground. Well, it's, it's, is, it's scary to think that these, these people who, you know, make these decisions you know our governments they might not be well intended uh maybe they are well intended but their actions often don't look that way they're not stupid people how how could they not see this like it, the thing that's you know i can't help but get angry as I, as I watch a number of your videos to think that they're making all of this a lot worse if we're going into this ice age as i think you have clearly clearly shown and you compile so much evidence from so many credible sources that it's clear to me uh all this lockdown stuff all of this now these in my opinion staged protests or or, or started uh, riots this is going to uh, exacerbate this beyond i don't know if it's beyond anything we've seen in history before but it is it is quite uh it's quite troubling to think about Without a question, and I want to I want to return to the to the human side of this in in one second. Let me just I want to start sure. sharing slides so we can so I can see your face again. Um, yeah, yeah. But, so one last graphic here, and that is um, just to sort of underscore why your channel and your viewers are so important. And that is that you know, as we said, this this very important innate aspect of humanity of cultivating one's own food has largely been forgotten. When you look at, at a graph like this and see that it's down to 2.6% of people who are involved in any way with producing our food, yep, it starts to make sense why people are so disconnected from their food and why they Absolutely. just see a grocery store as this vending machine with an implicit promise that there will always be bright, shiny food 
on all yep. those aisles. And, yep. um, and we need to fix that. And so that's why your channel is so important. And that's why I'm so, I'm thrilled to be here with, with your audience today. Yeah. 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 Thanks for that. Um, yeah, I, I, observe, I observed that statistic years ago. It was kind of uh, what I actually based the, the thesis of my book around because that is a serious issue. Um, you know, if times are good and we're in this absolute era of abundance, well, maybe we don't need to have people on farms. And I think that's probably been part of the uh, thinking, at least economically, you know, that, okay, farms have begotten, got, got really efficient. We have this uh, economic system that can print money. You know, we've got this technology that makes things easier to do. And so uh, I think most people wouldn't think about it that much in detail, but that maybe perhaps for the string pullers, that's been a good justification to allow, to make it so so few people work on farms. Um, but it, it, it's, man, it's a serious situation we're in. It is. And so let's go back to the question you just posed is how are, how is it, what's going on, right? Why are the, uh, how are yeah. the powers, the people that are, that are in control, how is it that not only aren't they preparing us for this? Cause there are things that could be done. In fact, China has been doing a number of things to make sure that they secure um, huge spots of land across the growing zones in Africa, which will stay online. Um, actually, I want to make a quick clarification and that is, that is you said we are going into an ice age and while that might actually be true what we can definitely say with certainty is that we're going into rougher growing seasons so there's right. it's not entirely fair to say that we're entering into an ice age and i just want to be very careful with our language because i knew this is going to be new for some people yeah and and i just want to be careful um because yeah, because it would be easy to interpret even the, ch the name of your channel as ice age farmer and as uh okay, we're going into this ice age, which means that we're going to be under uh, 12 feet of snow year round. That, that's not necessarily the case. And when you look at these things historically, um, these are cycles and they happen. And uh, I can tell you from my own experience, 10 years farming, and I'm actually curious real quick before I say this, when, when did this, this one that we're kind of going into right now start? Like when did we really start to see these consistent cooler temperatures well uh solar cycle 24 began around 2005 and so that was when the muted that was coming out of a normal minimum but sort of staying lower than than one would than we had previously and that would right, be when right. some of these things started to started to come into play yeah okay because when i when i started farming back in uh 2009 I had about three years that were really nice growing seasons. Um, I was, it, I was, you know, I'm in Canada here. I, I, I was out. I remember my first year of farming. My first year of production was 2010. I was rototilling in January, outside, outside, mm -hmm. and every year after that. Uh, and I remember it was 35 degrees Celsius, which is like 80 something high 80s uh in april here which was amazing um but i also remember when i was a kid it wasn't like that that's so why i'm curious uh, to putting all this together with my memory and how i've experienced weather is is interesting but i can tell you with absolute certainty with with my experience farming the last seven years have been progressively colder Mm -hmm. longer shoulder uh colder shoulder seasons colder winters summers like this summer is uh seemingly already a lot colder than the last colder start to the season a lot of the summer crops that i put out um early on that wouldn't would have normally been fine have failed it's uh i mean more and more incentive to get greenhouses in a nutshell but but it's really interesting how um you can hear this information that you're presenting, but then, you know, I can sit here and go, you know what, a lot of that makes sense to what I'm actually experiencing in the field. Yeah, we're experiencing it. Definitely. And, you know, again, I don't want to oversimplify. There are, there are lots of factors at play. It's an incredibly dynamic system. There are ocean currents and sea surface temperatures and all, all of these come into play. And a lot of those are cycles as well. Um, so, so some, some of what you're talking about could be those as well as, like we said, the fact that we were in a, a modern maximum that uh, that we're just coming out of so so absolutely mm -hmm. 
Um, okay, so you mentioned that the people who should be helping us right now could be enacting policies to, um, you know, secure better growing zones, or at least make sure that we move to a more distributed and resilient mode of food production instead of just doubling down on the toxic monocropping we've been doing. Um, so, you know, what's, what's going on there? Some of your videos, Curtis, um, in the past talked about also the unfair regulations, especially in BC, um, yeah, but but more broadly, like there are places everywhere, and I remember around one the world from uh, yeah in Florida where they were saying you no know, front yard gardens should be illegal and mm -hmm. your, your fines being passed for those things. So, um, so I think you are right to to call out that there are restrictions being put on people's ability to grow food, and I guess I would take it a step further and say that there are definitely forces working against our ability to be to do that to be self sufficient in any way, including food. Um, and that's because they are very interested in consolidating control over everyone into a very yeah. few, yeah, into a, the hands of a very few people. Um, some of the things like making front yard gardens illegal, it should be, it's just ridiculous at face value, it's unless insane. you really pull that thread up and start to understand the motivations behind it. They want control of the food supply and they want control over you. It reminds yeah. me of, um, of, of Bill Mollison, right? The, one of the permaculture... Yeah gurus who i love this quote who said there's something inherently seditious about permaculture isn't there because a man <laughs> who, can, who can grow his own food is much more difficult to control and i think he nailed it with that one if you don't need the companies if you don't need their terminator seeds then they have no leverage over you you don't have to pay them absolutely money. if you can feed yourself you can free yourself yeah and and it's there's other ways to free yourselves too. And I think, you know, I'm, I'm always somebody who's thinking about what's, what's the, the best path towards liberty. How do, how do we achieve that in, in every aspect? And uh, food has got to be one that is, um, I don't want to say it's easy, but you can obtain a lot of liberty through growing your own food. I've certainly experienced that and I've seen thousands around the world experience that. And, um, Man, it's there's there's never been a better time to be a farmer than now. Uh, there's certainly challenges, but what they're doing to small farmers right now uh, is absolutely um, it's it's really disheartening. I, you know, I, I tapped into it last year when I really got deep into reading laws and and kind of opened a, a wormhole of. Uh, this legislation and really kind of tore into it and, and started to learn a lot about the, the country that I live in or the, the de facto country, I should say. And, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, th th these things have been, uh, in the works for a long time and it's, uh, it's, it's, it's interesting and, and terrifying, but potentially could be liberating for many people if they can come to grips with the truth. Right. So yeah, if you can take it and, and sit with it and it takes a lot of courage when you're talking about feeding your family, being at jeopardy, it takes some courage to sit with an idea like that. Mm -hmm. But, um, but absolutely it's, it's very, I think if you can use that as a catalyst to inspire the change that fundamentally we should all be doing anyway, we know growing your own food is much more health. It's one of the ways that it gives you more Liberty is it gives you your health back, right? It gives you good nutritive food. And so, Liberty across a number of vectors, I would say. And you're also right that, yes, that this is just the, the latest uh, skirmishes in a long-standing war that, uh, that I go deep into on my channel. And we won't go that deep today, but just, um, you know, just briefly, you realize that the Rockefeller Foundation, who I think is almost pretty well known to have taken over medicine and healthcare, at least in the U.S., and sort of push yes. that out to the rest of the world, right? Um, yep. Did the exact same thing to food. They, they uh, took over the food supply, and then they weaponized the USDA to um, push out this, this highly petrochemical-dependent form of toxic agriculture to the rest of the world, yep. and get rid of indigenous practices, and sort of Absolutely. form all of humanity. Um, yeah, Vandana Shiva I'm, does a fantastic job of talking about that. She does, and and I, I also James Corbett has some fantastic uh, documentaries on, on the Rockefeller family. You know, it's interesting with the Rockefellers too because they also built stone barns. I'm not sure if you're familiar with stone barns. It's the uh, it's that center for sustainable agriculture in upstate New York. It's with the 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 restaurant uh, that Dan, the famous chef Dan Barber, works at. Mm -hmm. So. 
you know, it's, it, it, these individuals and families are, are complex. And, and it, I, I often, I really wish I could be a fly on a wall to understand why they do the things that they do. Why is it that the Rockefeller family has funded basically everything that's terrible about medicine and food to make people sick and make the soil sick and do all this destructive, these, all these destructive things to the environment and to, to people, yet they go and uh, open up stone barns, which is where all these market gardeners go every year to have this conference. And it's, it's, it's really interesting. You know, it's kind of like um, GMOs for thee, but not for me. Exactly. You know, and um, it's, uh, it, it drives me a little bit crazy, uh, to be honest. And um, I, uh, cause I, I, cause I see that in my space, you know, a lot of these leaders in sustainable agriculture go to this stone barns event every year, yet Rockefellers are funding all of these things. Um, and Vandana Shiva is an absolute powerhouse when it comes to pointing these out. She's done a really good job at pointing out the, the, the hypocrisies of Bill Gates as well, mm -hmm. who was also funded by uh, the, the, the Rockefeller family and the connections to them go way back even to his father. You know, so it's, uh, it's, it's very interesting when you start putting these things together. Absolutely. I'm glad to hear yeah, some of that. Um, and um, and those, those same billionaires are also more recently, you know, those, those the Rockefellers in history and, and, and sort of the Green Revolution. And like you said, Bill Gates now continuing that using genomic mapping to just com take complete control over the genetic diversity of the planet. Um, and, and then more recently, I guess the last four or five years now, these philanthropists, these billionaires have started throwing their money. And I mean, to the tune of billions of dollars into the space, the ag tech space which is this yeah. unholy alliance between big tech and big agriculture. Yep. And they um, are very open about their desire to move everyone off of small, holistic, organic farms. That's no, we're not going to do it that way. We're now going to no. move to indoor robotic, vertical uh, growing and lab grown meat with insect proteins. Yeah. Uh, all in the stated, you know, open, open mission statement to replace and end animal agriculture. It's, it's insane. Cause I've seen those, I've seen, I've been up in um, parts of Alberta where you see massive monocultures of peas, which are what you are used for these uh, beyond meat burgers, field peas. Mm -hmm. People don't realize, uh, and that product could never be certified organic because they desiccate the crops with Roundup. So the old school way of desiccating a crop was basically letting it dry, hoping for a dry s uh, spell in the summer. And then you could let the crop, dr stop irrigating the crop, let it dry out. Then they go and harvest it and thresh it. But the way they do it now is they spray it with Roundup to desiccate it in three days. And then they come in and thresh it. You know, it's, it's absolutely insane. You know, it's also worth pointing out since we were on the topic, I don't want to go back to it too far, but it is worth pointing out. We talked about the Rockefeller Foundation. Uh, they were also the ones behind the uh, the club of rome which is the organization that basically drafted up the modern climate change and environmentalist movement and isn't it interesting that the men that and women that that funded all of these really bad horrible things in agriculture are the ones that are leading the sort of charge with environmentalism. When I woke up to that cuz I used to go to conferences and and speak at these environmentalist conferences started seeing who the funders were and things like that, I really started to wake up to it. And that, that whole club of Rome, I mean, none of what you and I are talking about is, is theory. This is all bona fide facts and they're all historically ref You can reference any of this stuff. Mm -hmm. You can find it anywhere. And, uh, it is, it's really interesting. Um, and I don't know, I don't, you know, you, you pull the lens back and you start to look at what's going on now. Um, it's, it's pretty obvious who the people are who, are who are trying to make mayhem in the United States and Canada and the world. Yeah, and for whom they work. Um, yeah, absolutely. These, um, the Club of Rome also gives away, of course, to the United Nations. And it, it's, I was going to say, I think we are disadvantaged because the whole thing is so freaking crazy. It's just, it's insane. And if you walk up to someone on the street and just start downloading this into them. They're like, what are you talking about? None, this is yeah. impossible. I could, I wouldn't even buy that science fiction movie at half price. Right. So yeah. it's, it's, yeah. it's almost hard to, to get some of these ideas across, but 
the the balancing factor there is that we're lucky that they're entirely open about it right the, since the club of rome and even before that openly writing about their intentions to have a transhumanist totalitarian takeover of the entire human species and everything that goes along with it and food is absolutely a critical part of what makes us human like i said it's not just the cultivation that i reference as uh, an innate part of us but it's our culture but you know we have hamburgers in america and f- traditional feasts that come with the harvest season and the, it's yep. everything about our spirituality even in many cases and our culture comes intimately with food because it's something we have to do and we do every day and it's, it's important yeah, absolutely um, that, that's the one thing that i've really started to see is when you pull a lens back really what's happening is on all fronts there's a massive push to disconnect us from who we are where we stand and what we're actually supposed to be. And um, it, it, seeing that, uh, and actually, as I've been spent the last year really researching the law, that's been, become my pastime, my kind of hobby when I'm not working or with my family. And um, you see it there too, the legal system, the corporate creative, the corporate fiction, the, 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 the all caps name person, all of these Everything in every aspect of human interaction and institutions is to disconnect us from our true divinity. And, and I, I can honestly tell you, Christian, I've never really been a spiritual guy, but through my research in law and, and seeing the correlation between um, how our nature is so connected to nature, it's made me spiritual. Because it, it, it's made me see what the controllers don't want us to see. Exactly. And, and in a way, that's kind of, um, it's invigorated my, my spirituality and uh, awakened me to our true nature and our true purpose. And it's basically going against everything these assholes are trying to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The future, their future for humanity doesn't look very human at all. You're exactly right. Not at all. Um, and these are the stated goals, again, from the United Nations um, they've codified this into a number of you know, agendas, Agenda 21, Agenda 2030. More recently, the IPCC's land use report that said, get rid of animal agriculture, start eating insect protein. Um, and then the EU just, again, codified some of the recommendations from the UN's body into, uh, into the EU farm to fork policy. This is just within the last couple of weeks, Curtis, because they're moving, if you pardon the expression, they're moving whole hog on this takeover of the food supply uh, and, and uh, across all of their agendas actually right now during this crisis, they're not letting that go to waste at all. Wow. So is there anything else you wanted to present in this, uh, this conversation? Well, I just, that you had? quickly, I want to mention that it makes sense to disconnect people from animal agriculture when you realize that, uh, without the animal's manure, you know, you, you, you break the, the nutrient cycle, right? When you, when you do that, if we don't have animals, we can't close the loop. And so then you, you return to a state of being dependent on the, uh, on the inputs, the petrochemical inputs and stuff like that. So that's, that's such that's a helpful. good point to make because, re- because truly regenerative agriculture, which has existed for many years, a lot of people think this is a new idea, but you go back, you know, even a hundred years, uh, I think among the pioneers in the West, the, the original family farms were quite regenerative and they maybe not, well, m- maybe they were regenerative in the sense that, that they could build soil with animals. The ruminant of the, of these, of these animals uh, has the ability to create compost quicker than anything else. And, and it's that synergy between the animals, the, the, the man, all the other plants on the farm really creates a, holistic balance that uh that you don't get in this system this system is all about compartmentalization and centralization and when you compartmentalize and centralize everything and everybody you control it right it's just like henry kissinger is one of his greatest quotes about controlling the food and controlling the people right that this is this is the move more more farmers and people in this space need to wake up to it i i think I think what we have to do is wake up a lot of these environmentalists who saw, who see the problems in the big picture. They're just not, they haven't put together 
because they, 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 they think anything discussion like this is a conspiracy theory, but it's not. That word is just used to dehumanize those who are looking for the truth and are calling it out. Um, but there could be so much unity in these ideas and in this movement because this isn't this is true environmentalism this is true social justice though i hate that word but but we need we need to have these conversations and accept the reality because if we don't if we don't start to acknowledge the truth you can't move forward if we don't if we just sit there and criticize anybody who is criticizing the the conventional narrative we can't move forward if we're not aware of who our enemies are I couldn't agree more. It's really well said, Curtis. And uh, that's why I appreciate you having this conversation today and getting the message out there on your platform. Um, yeah, I mean, stepping, stepping back a bit, we, we find ourselves, I think, at, at this confluence of things between the natural cycles that we've talked about, uh, the forces that are clearly working against us. I think we're, we're on the precipice of, of arguably the most significant and impactful disruption to our food supply in history. And so that is going to mean that it takes everyone. This is everyone has to effectively drop what you're doing, get your head in the game, spread the word. And, um, you know, we all have unique experiences and backgrounds and ways that we work that we can bring to the table that other, that, that's, that's what it, it's unique. That's what I mean. It's, it's, it's ours and ours alone. And that's why it takes everyone to take those unique skills and backgrounds and apply them to this problem that we all find ourselves facing right now. Um, the, the good news, and it is good news, is that as we've said, monocropping and the way that, that, um, that uh, you know, the Kaffirs, these, these terrible factory farms, this is not agriculture done right. And it, right. it, it, it did need to go, it had to go. Yeah. Um, the sooner yeah. the better, as long as we have a, a smooth transition to, to something regenerative, to something better. Um, they were, in fact, here's another use of, of the straw man. They were straw man now for what they're trying to say we need to get rid of is, is animal agriculture. Because if we can instead move to the healthy, the holistic and the regenerative practices, and especially an emphasis on um, soil husbandry, right? Building up that soil biome. Yep. You find that a number of the, of the, uh, the problems that I mentioned today are actually mitigated just by doing the right thing, right? So if we increase our organic matter in our soil, but we know that allows better infiltration of water, so the flash flooding won't be as much of an issue. Um, you can withstand, it's, it's better absorbing and holds that moisture better, so you can withstand both the deluge and the drought. And then uh, same thing for on the temperature front, if you've got temperature extremes, then a lot of good soil life makes your plants better, more resilient for those sorts of things. I had a great Absolutely. conversation recently with, uh, with Gabe Brown, who I'm sure your audience knows. He's the regenerative. Uh, uh, yeah. Oh, okay. And, um, and, and walked through some of the ways that he has, has been experienced. I mean, North Dakota has been hit pretty hard these yes. last few seasons. Yeah. And, you know, it's just a pleasure to talk to him and hear, A, hear about the regenerative practices and get the word out there. But then B, hear that while the, you know, the farm next door to his was underwater and then the one over here was completely fallow after the frost and here's gabe just green as can be completely self-sufficient yeah. no external inputs it's just a, a beautiful elegant model of the right way to do things and the fact that it makes us more resilient just by doing the right thing yeah and and perhaps the better word is anti-fragile as, as uh, you might be familiar with nasim taleb but th but that that is you know we have to continuously you know drill down on these comparisons to nature because nature um, left to its own device is anti-fragile, just like how muscle tissue is anti-fragile. You know, it, it gets stronger with resistance and so does nature. And, and the more we can move back to our, to our humanity, because we, we have all of these institutions trying to pull us away from our humanity, move back to our humanity, we'll not only be able to live through this little blip of uh, this cold spell that's coming and, and, and has been going on for a long time, but we can thrive and we can perhaps move humanity up to the next level of evolution. And I don't know exactly what that looks like, but I, I think I have some ideas, but uh, it could be very exciting. It could be a, an exciting time. And, and perhaps with everything that's happening now, 
these this was maybe this was meant to happen sometimes i like to believe, i like to think in, in about destiny maybe this was meant to happen because the fact that the elites the controllers of the world are just throwing shit at a wall to see what sticks and that they're trying so many things right now they're they're doubling down on every tactic they've been doing for a long time but they're doing them all now at once that's got to wake some people up absolutely yeah yeah, no, no, there's no question. A ton of people are waking up right now. Um, and and then again, even just with respect to food, a ton of people. That's why there are seed shortages and compost shortages right now is because there are so many people who wanted to start gardens this year. And uh, and so, there are, yeah, these are these are great signs that, um, that I think underscore that all of this cacophony that we've just been talking about can also be, it can, it can be scary and it can be a very real problem that we have to deal with, but it's so too can it be the catalyst that, like you says, really um, enables us to, to take this whole operation of humanity to the next level. Absolutely. So this has been a fantastic conversation, Christian. Thanks for doing this. If people want to, uh, I, I would really encourage everybody in my audience to check out your content. You've got so many good uh, detailed videos. I love how you source, you, you, you point to all of your sources. You're not sitting here riffing on theories. You're, you're collecting data from around the world. So where do people go to, to learn more about you? Absolutely. You can find me at iceagefarmer.com. For the time being, I am still on YouTube, but I've also stood up a bitshoot.com slash iceagefarmer channel there. Um, and those are the iceagefarmer.com will be the hub. I'll always be there because that's my own server. Amazing. Thanks for doing this, Christian. It's been my pleasure. Thanks again, Curtis.